Channel 40, radio check over. Thanks, mate. Um, I'm doing a little bit of a documentary on UHF radios in Australia. Would you mind just telling me how UHF impacts your daily life? <laughs> that was an infected me. All right. You got a spare couple of days? Going back 15 years ago, the radio never, the, the radio never went off. It was always like to send the volume up. I get up in the morning. Yeah, communication with UHFs are very important in the biosphere in rural Victoria. But really, by law, that uh, Channel 40 is the um, road transport channel. When they get into Bernie, uh, there's just too many dickheads that are on the uh, two-way to really get any good. UHF CB radios, or ultra high frequency system band radios, have been a part of the full driving community for years now. And today, I'm joining the club. <laughs> Jamie's hooked me up with their XRS Connect system, and I can't wait to install it. But today's video isn't going to be about installations. No, today we're going to tell a story. We're going to tell a story about UHF in Australia, about its history, about its technology, and about how you can get the most out of your UHF radio. Radio waves. They're a huge part of our daily lives. You're most likely using them right now to watch this very video. Right now as I sit here on my tailgate, there are radio waves going on all around me at all different frequencies. It was German professor Heinrich Hertz who was the first person to tame these waves, generating them in his laboratory. These waves were going to change the world, and because anyone could just produce them, theoretically, there needed to be some sort of regulation around it. Now, in order for this technology to be actually implemented into society, the ITU, or International Telecommunications Union, set up a spectrum between 30 hertz and 300 gigahertz. They then divided the spectrum into 12 bands, and this is known as our radio spectrum. Now, you're probably all familiar with the band UHF, but did you know there's 11 other bands ranging from ELF used in like submarines and EHF used in satellites? Then in, in between there's FM radios, there's Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, all these other different bands that are used for different technology. But for today's video, we're just gonna be looking at UHF, specifically citizen band radio in Australia. So CB radio, or citizen band radio, is authorised by the Australian government, New Zealand government, Vanuatu government, and I think Malaysian government as well. So it's for our region, and they basically regulate what frequencies the public can use and how they can use them. There are also restrictions on our radios themselves. We're not allowed to operate radios on the CB network that have a higher output power of 5 watts. And this is because signal strength is mainly a result of output power. See, radio, big radio dishes and radio towers pumping out your FM tunes, they're pumping out about 50,000 to 100,000 watts of power, whereas our UHF radios and our Forbes are only 5 watt. So 5 watt compared to 100,000 watts. So not only would you not be able to run a 100,000 watt radio in your car, because I'm pretty sure your cigarette lighter port or your accessories port would blow up, um, but if you were able to communicate through a UHF at 100,000 watts, you'd simply talk over every single trucker in Melbourne because you'd have that transmission power. So yes, look, you can buy higher powered illegal radios online. I, I understand that, but to put in perspective how serious the authorities take this, firstly, they will find you. Secondly, they will come for you to tear down your antenna. And thirdly, they will imprison you. That you can get imprisoned up to two years or have a $25,000 fine for causing interference on the CB network. So if you jumped on with a high power radio, started talking over emerging services or anything like that, there's serious consequences for breaking the regulation. But luckily for me, and probably a lot of other people out there, uh, companies like GME and other radio manufacturers, uh, they stick to the laws and regulations, and this is just a 5 watt radio that is perfectly legal. But, speaking of legalities, did you know that there are some radio channels that is actually illegal to talk on? So under the CB plan, they divided up the channels into purposes. So for example, channels 5 and 35 are to be used for emergency only. Channel 11 is the calls channel, which is used for initiating calls, and then you'd move to another more general channel. Channel 22 and 23 is only for telemetry data and telecommand. And on the newer 80 channel units, 61, 62 and 63 are reserved for future purposes. Now they're the legally legislated channels under the license, but there are other channels that are used for purposes that the community sort of taken on as their own. So for example, we, we have channel 40, which is our national truckers channel, which uh, you know, you ever want traffic updates, anything, channel 40 is always a massive one uh, all across Australia. 
There's channel 10, which is for 4x4s, uh, 4x4 clubs, so throughout your tracks, they're on channel 10. There's channel 18 for caravanners and, and camper vans, you know, doing the convoys. And there's channel 29, which is actually for uh, a part of trucking route up near Tweed Heads in New South Wales that a company used to use it, so I just there's a bit of a story behind it, but it's all just fallen into uh, common channel use up there. So Tweed 9 is what they use up in Tweed Heads and Newcastle, I think. So up there behind me, you might be able to see a mountain. And on top of that mountain, there is a radio tower, which features a repeater station for UHF. So now, what a repeater station is, it essentially inputs a message and then outputs a message. So going from a standard, you know, CB radio range of 10 to 15 kilometers, that thing can boost up to 100 kilometers. Now, how do you use these towers, you might ask. So anyone that has a UHF can use these radio towers. If you have the duplex function on your UHF unit, which pretty much all of them do, you can access channels through one to eight, turn on duplex mode, and use those towers to boost your range up to 100 kilometers. So say if I want to talk to someone on the other side of that mountain, using duplex mode and channels one to eight, I could communicate to them. So these are fantastic for when you're doing, you know, remote area touring. We have limited phone reception. If you ever need need assistance or an emergency, you can jump on channel five on the duplex and try your best luck to get it to get someone on the network. So repeater towers are stationed all around Australia, usually on top of mountains like this one behind me. Um, but they're a fantastic resource, and there's a good community of people to keep them going. Um, and they're free to use, but use them respectfully um, and don't clog them because. Yeah, you imagine someone jumping on a tower like that, they can, you can hear them for a, long, for a long distance, so yeah. So I'll give you a quick demonstration on how to actually use the repeater towers. So grab your radio, you want to head over to channels 1 to 8. So for example, that radio up there receives on channel 4, so I'm going to go on channel 4. What you're going to want to do is you want to hit the duplex button to turn on duplex mode. And now... Seem to have some uh, people on there at the moment, but if you hear me call to a call to the... See that bounce back? So to know when you're connected to a repeater station, if you try and transmit on through channel one to eight with duplex mode turned on, you'll hear it actually talk back to you or call back to you. So by hitting duplex, you should be able to see this radio tower icon, and then you should be able to talk to the tower. Notice the difference between duplex on and duplex off. So all this information is great, but if you actually have an antenna, you're not going to be hearing or transmitting anything. So external antennas are legally permitted. They range anywhere from 1 dB up to 12 dB. And I know this topic's been beaten to death, but I'll talk about gain just quickly for those who don't know. So gain is essentially the transmission pattern that the antenna puts out. So we measure this in dBi. High gain antennas, so a gain of say 12 dB, these are really tight and narrow patterns that, that spread out a long distance, but they're quite narrow. And then a lower dB, like this 2.1, is a more rounded transmission pattern. Better for sort of high country areas, mountainous country. And you want to sort of pick your aerial based on what environment you're going to be doing most of your driving in. For me, example, I live out in the mountains. We're in a very mountainous area, as you can see here, there's repeater towers around me. This area is rugged, there's a lot of foliage, there's a lot of disruption in, in, in this area. UHF is primarily a line of sight form of communication. So in, in areas like this, dense, dense, dense bush, dense mountains, a lower gain antenna is actually gonna be better for communication. Sure, if I lived out in, in, you know, in the fields, uh, a rural Victoria, I'd go for a high gain antenna, definitely, for those you know, long road trips on the road, highways, etc. But out in this mountainous country, these low gain antennas perform the best. So when picking an antenna, pick one for your environment. But luckily with the GME XRS platform, they're interchangeable antennas. So you literally undo a little Allen key, you get your Allen key out, you undo this, and you can swap out your antenna to one of their high gain antennas. So unfortunately, I only have their 2.1 dBi antenna, but if I say had a 6.6 .6 or even a higher gain antenna, I could say, all right, we're doing a trip out into rural uh, Australia or outback of Australia. I want a higher gain antenna, you know, on those long flat areas. So I'd swap out this, throw in a high gain antenna, and um, there you have it. And then I'm get, get back home, we're going up the mountains. I put my, uh, my little 
low gain 2.1 dBi antenna back on. And I think this is awesome because yes, you can put in um, a coaxial switch, which essentially like you could run two antennas on the top of your, on the front of your car. You could have one low gain, one high gain antenna. Um, you have to be careful about how you space them apart. And the mere sort of addition of a coaxial switch lowers the overall gain of both antennas. So you, you, this is really the best way to get the least amount of like gain drop, I guess you'd call it. Um, but yeah, putting a switch in is possible and a lot of people do do it and say it's not that bad. Um, I have heard that it's pretty much impossible to have a switch that has zero loss of gains. So I think having an interchangeable antenna is just freaking awesome. So getting the most out of your antenna. Look, if you're looking for optimal performance, don't do what I've done, don't mount it on the bull bar. I simply mounted it on the bull bar for practicality reasons. I still think it performs great in the bull bar, but if you're looking for to get the best, best, best you can get out of your antenna, you're gonna wanna put it on the roof, specifically in the center of the roof. Because imagine how the signal comes out, right? You wanna even spread in all directions, and you want it as high as possible. UHF is line of sight, remember? Mainly line of sight. There's a slight bit of ground, but mainly line of sight. So the higher you are, the further the horizon is meaning the further you can transmit your signal. So I think I'm gonna probably play around and maybe experiment with that up on the roof and see how it goes, but I've got it on the bull bar just for practicality reasons, so you can get underneath stuff and through stuff. Um, and they do have a massive spring on them, so don't worry about it being on the bull bar, like it's gonna cope with the Corys all right and any diesel vibrations, like it, it handles. Um, if I've see, I have seen weaker antennas literally just shake themselves to death, um, but that is being absolutely solid. And especially on a diesel car like this, you want something that's actually got a big spring on it for those Cory roads, um, it's not gonna fall apart. Now I do quickly want to touch on HF radio. A few might have heard of HF radio or seen massive antennas on cars, you know, doing big overland trips. Um, HF is high frequency radio. So you need a license to operate on these frequencies, but those radios are powerful enough to transmit over 3000 kilometers. Due to the frequency they use, they can actually sort of um, send their message off the ion sphere, which helps get that crazy range they have. And they're also 100 watts rather than the five watts that we have on our car. But you do need a license to operate, so you need to be part of a radio club or network. Um, there's some good things. A lot of overlanders used to use them. You go that you could uh, get daily weather reports. You could talk to a real person on the other end of the line, and they're great in emergency situations out in the bush. Where, you know, back in the day, they didn't have all this cheap satellite technology we have now. They didn't have PLBs or any of that. So HF was literally like kind of your only way to talk to people. And it's funny because after hit, watching a bunch of videos about them and, and listening to the guys online talk about them in the old forum posts and whatever, they would never do what I've done here. They would never mount their antenna to their bull bar. And you know why they don't mount their antenna onto the bull bar? If you're at bush and you get in an accident, you hit a cow, you hit a deer, you hit, you hit anything, nine times out of 10, it's gonna render whatever's on your bull bar useless. Your antenna will just simply break and then you'll be stuck out in the bush in an accident without a form of communication. So a lot of them actually mount their HF radios or even UHF radios on the back of their vehicle, like up uh, if they have a rear tire carrier on the on the tire carrier, up back on the roof. Because if yeah, if you get in an accident, then what's the first thing that's gonna break? Your antenna. So it's just funny, I just never really thought about that. But yeah, in a survival situation, you get in an accident, maybe if you go on overland, don't put it on the front of your bull bar. But obviously, for practicality reasons, I've got mine on the front. So obviously I chose the smaller gain antenna and mounted it on the bull bar, but let me know whereabouts you put yours. Did you put yours on the roof, the back of the car, and what size antenna, what gain did you use? High gain, low gain? Let me know in the comments. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thanks so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day on the road. You can get out there, you keep on tracking, man. Thanks, mate. See ya. Over and out. So I think that roughly sums up the truck, uh, like the UHF network. I think in rural areas, these channel 40 and channels like that are still used regularly to, to, to communicate and provide actual relevant information. On the major freeways in the city, I think it's a bit of a, a crap show. Um, there's a lot of 
you know, foul language and stuff on it and bad communication. Um, but I think in those remote areas, and it is truly, you still use to this day as a solid form of communication and provides a real remote communities, a form of communication when there simply might not be any others. So what do I think the future holds for UHF? I think it's still a bright future. I think more people are getting out there exploring. And look, as satellite technology becomes more prominent, we might see a change up in the future. But for right now, I think UHF radio is still fantastic way to communicate um, with other with other vehicles, with other base camps, convoys, etc. Um, it's a really affordable system to use, and if you use it properly, you can get a lot out of it. So I think it's still got a huge place, especially in a country like Australia. So I guess the question I should answer is, why did I choose to run the GME XRS system? And now obviously, yes, GME sent me the unit, but I was running GME beforehand anyway. I had a TX4400 in the Majero, which I transferred across to the 80 series when I bought this car. It was by far the best radio out of the convoy. Um, it was probably close to 15 years old, but it still worked 100%. It was fantastic. Um, my connection with the area was getting a bit sloppy um, after I did the transplant from the Pajero the 80. So that was sort of my reasoning for wanting to move on. Plus I wanted to get that extra 40 channels. So I had 80 channels um, because on public holidays, those channels do fill up pretty fast. The XRS platform I feel is just like a really refined platform. It's something you can tell they put a lot of time into. Everything from how nice the handheld looks to how sleek their little, uh, the actual unit itself is. Um, you can really run and hide this away and just do everything from the handheld. And look, for some people, might they might not prefer the handheld, but I actually really, really like it. Um, it's got all the buttons you need on there. It's got a heap of cool features like you can play back recent messages. So the last message that has been transmitted, you can actually play back. So if you were in a convoy with someone and you missed what they said, you, before you, get... you press that button, you hear what, what was mentioned. It, it's a really awesome system. And um, I think it just shows like UHF, as much as the technology hasn't changed a lot in the past oh, decades, GME have made strides to really try and take it into the 21st century with their XRS Connect app where you can you can send like location data on that app and transmit it to your other mates on XRS. It's it's a really awesome system and I think it's got a heap of future potential um, use, um, especially now that this, we all carry smartphones and GPSs with us. How can we best make that technology work with our radio wave technology? And I think they're doing an awesome job at it. I love the unit. It's crystal clear, nice and loud, easy to use. And going from an older GME to a new one, it's worth the upgrade. I absolutely love it. And another great thing, it's Australian made. This is the only Australian made UHF. And I think it's just absolutely fantastic that an electronic good can still be made here in Australia, tested here in Australia, made for the Australian environment. And you can just tell, like this magnetic mount, for instance, it's designed for corrugated roads. It doesn't come off. It's like little things like that, like the antenna, the spring on it. Like it's designed for our country, our climate, our roads. And I think that's just a great thing that GME have done, you know, keeping it in-house, keeping it Australian made. And I give GME credit for that because I'm sure it's cheaper to make this stuff overseas. I'm sure it is, but to keep it in-house, to keep it in Australia, I think is fantastic and it really does set their brand apart from the rest. So there's my video about UHF technology. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. Um, thanks so much to GME for sending out the antenna for me to do this little video. Um, it's a beautiful antenna and I'm actually really fascinated by radio technology now. I've, I've done a heap of research in making this video and yeah, I don't know, it's, it's really cool and I think it's an awesome system and I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy to see it live on even in today's age where you got mobile phones and all that easy as. But yeah, anyway, hope you guys enjoy. Give it a like if you like this video and I'll see you guys next, next, next time in the next video, whatever that's gonna be. So yeah, cheers guys, have a good one.